In this video, you're gonna get to see myself and Bobby O'Neill, one of, oh, oh, hey, what's up, Murph? If you don't know him, go follow I Coach Baseball. He's, he's pretty great. But in the video, you're gonna get to see me and Bobby, not Murph, but go follow him, play catch, talk about pitchers, catchers, what he liked when he was pitching in catchers, all that stuff, and I'm sorry, I did a bad job of staying in frame, so my bad. I'm Coach Fuji with Catch Made Simple. This is Bobby O'Neill. What's up, man? What's up, dude? What's up? Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Pitching coach in Southern California. Yes, sir. Tell them a little bit about yourself. Well, we actually went to the same college. I'm predating him significantly, but uh, <laughs> yeah, we, we both went to Biola back when I was at Biola. I was actually in NAIA, so technically I'm not as cool as him, but, but yeah, I guess for a little bit you were actually in NAIA as well, right? Yeah, for two years. Yeah, so I guess you're half, half. Um, yeah, a little bit more on the cool side, but uh, yeah, I got drafted out of Biola in 2011 and played with a couple pro teams, had a couple injuries, and now I've been coaching full-time for the last 11 years. And you're kind of an expert in arm path. I mean, I've learned from a lot of bad experiences, so I definitely know how to do it wrong. And so from that, I educate people on what not to look like. But yeah, I'd like to say I've had a lot of experience over the last few years. I love it. I love it. Well, we're just gonna play a little catch here and then we can just talk about whatever, so tune in. Don't judge me. <laughs> <laughs> so when you warm up, yeah. is there anything specific that like you instruct your players to do like um, before they throw? Oh, definitely. There, there are so many different pre-throwing routines that you can get into. And I like to tell all of my clients that if you're spending less than 15 minutes warming up your arm and your body, you're probably doing it wrong. Interesting. Yeah, the Diamondbacks were really, really big on like prehab and taking care of your body. So I actually did that before I got here. Did you? <laughs> yeah, I, I still got the habit today. I respect it. Yeah, so many things. It's kind of like a head to toe checklist that you go down. But I'd say the most important thing that you can do is just make sure that you have kind of a wet going before that you throw and make sure that you're not throwing to warm up. Interesting. That's one of the biggest mistakes that people make. 100%. Yeah, yeah. I finally, over the last 10 years, we finally have like a physical therapist at the facility I train at and they make content all the time kind of showing what it looks like to have a proper pre-throwing routine. If I wanted to put in a plug, it's pure physical therapy, but it's P-U-E-R physical therapy. Oh, they do. oh, I think I've seen some of your videos. With yeah, them. yeah. I like to collab with them a lot. I want to help get their name out there a little bit, but yeah, they do do a great job and they're coming out with a whole bunch of like pre-throwing stuff. Very cool. Very nice. Well, so you already did some warm-up stuff? I did, right? yeah. And Just I a hit bit. a large bucket of golf balls too. There we go. <laughs> That's a day off right there. Oh, it was nice. Well, let's, let's just play a little catch. We can use your ball. And so I want to hear when you think about the biggest mistakes that people make when they're throwing, what would you say those are? Like specifically when it comes to arm path, we just talked about, you know, like making sure that we are warming up before we throw and stuff. But what, what about with arm path? What are the biggest mistakes there? Well, it kind of predates arm path slightly, but it more comes into your overall mindset behind throwing in general. And this is kind of where people mess up arm path. And it's, it's the intent that you throw at when you're first warming up. And not just necessarily like the velocity that you're throwing at, but the intent in when you break from the glove. Like if that is aggressive at the beginning, that's when things begin to get disorganized right out of the gate. And so as you get disconnected from the body, if you are having to disconnect from here, you're eventually going to gonna have to get reconnected again at the end. And so it, it, you have to like reorganize everything. Like there's a great example of one right there. Interesting. Yeah. So would you say disconnecting is like, cause I've heard like follow the elbow mm -hmm. with the ball. So disconnecting would be when the ball leads the throw. Exactly. Yeah. We throw the phrase around a lot of being like ball dominant. So where the ball is leading the path of the arm. If you want to be technical it's being proximal to distal so from the center of your body moving outwards instead of the other way around where you work from the outside in interesting so just kind of i like to think of the chest like stretching out like a rubber band instead of like trying to pull the chest through so it's more of like a relaxed whip in the pec instead of like a tense muscly bulky movement so when you move really fast out of the glove you set yourself up for having to like step on then the e-brake when you get, get too far yeah yeah so like you're getting too far back this way and that gets you stuck in the scaps and then you end up having to bounce out and like pushing the ball like a dart. Interesting. So another question that I have, because I remember talking about Biola actually, I just saw a photo pop up in my camera roll the other day when I showed up as a freshman and I 
when I was throwing, like I would have like my knee collapse like this. Yeah. And it's interesting because now I've done, I've done so many video analysis for catchers throwing. And one of the big things that I've noticed is that the MLB catchers, their foot comes up right away. Uh -huh. And the younger catchers have this like toe drag and slide and their knees collapse. And so I'm curious, I'm sure you have some cues or like analysis on what that is, why that matters. 100%. And I found out last year through one of my Instagram comments that that's called trail leg hip flexion. I actually had to Google that when someone commented that, but trail leg hip flexion is where your ankle and your knee are kind of following your hip. And so your hip is going from extension here into flexion. So all of that collapse is, is a big waste of energy. So huh. when you're leaking or wasting energy, we always think of that like a, like a leaking boat and you're trying to patch that hole. So for us, we kind of take it all the way back to the back toe and we say we want to turn the toe over to where it's like in the ground, like a Sharpie is on your back foot and you're like drawing like a one inch line. But that connection keeps your hip in some type of extension, not necessarily fully locked out, but some type of extension keeps the energy of your body connected to the ground longer and that helps you get all the way through your follow through get extension we get a lot more extension as pitchers than catchers do but having some type of stickiness to your back toe or or that sharpie in the ground just helps you get through the ball better interesting so the pr the what's the problem when we come here we just losing all that kinetic energy or Definitely, it's, it's, a, it's a potential energy thing and a kinetic energy thing, both just source and power output. Like you're not, you're not able to, to transfer that weight and transfer that energy properly. But it also kind of has some medical consequences as well. Like if you're thinking about arm path, you're thinking about connection to the body. So you wanna move through your core and through your hips and you want everything to be synced up when you lose half of what's supposed to be on the ground when you're letting go of the ball. That's that's one of two points of connection to the ground. You're more likely to get disconnected when you're in extreme end ranges. So like layback or even like coming up out of layback into follow through. If you're disconnected from the ground, you're most likely gonna get disconnected at end range where the elbow tends to leak forward and back into that like throwing a dart the, the position. The dart, interesting. Yeah, so a lot of guys where you see that they're cutting the ball. That it's because getting there yeah like their elbow leaks forward and that huh. kind of has to do with your hip rotation as well if, if guys are not able to keep their back foot on the ground they're most likely not clearing their hip so that also means that as their hips are getting to this position their trunk is then following the hips and if the trunk stops before it's supposed to the elbow compensates and then gets out in front of everything wow yeah it's kind of a it's a probably a lot more than this video worth of information to say but i think the the solution is a lot more simple than the problem and it's just keep your back toe sticky on the ground and let the tip of the whip kind of do the work at the end interesting so we're gonna make a, a short form video on this later today but one of the other big problems that I'll see with catchers a lot of times is like when we do our transfers, uh -huh. we'll keep our elbows down here. And I always stress getting the elbows high. And I think I know why it's so important because of what we were just talking about earlier of how the, the humerus will rotate in the shoulder socket. But why, like what problems happen if our elbows are down when we go to throw. <clears throat> so there's a lot of problems. I'd, I'd say if if I could really quick, I'm just gonna yeah, yeah. come up to you and I'm gonna punch you in the face. <laughs> okay, <laughs> if I'm gonna punch you in the face, I'm gonna punch you from up here. I'm not gonna punch you from here, right? right. Maybe if I'm uppercutting, but even then there's so much more. Punch. This is the knockout punch right. yeah, where your elbow and shoulder and all everything is all in line and you're going into that like shoulder blade retraction and then you're going into that full like explosive power position. We refer to this spot as the power position where you're kind of above your armpit hairs, but not above your, your, above shoulder. your shoulder and not getting into the ear. So like a scapular winging would be getting too high above this position there. or not scapular winging uh, inverted w and, oh yeah um, that's what strasburg so, had yeah so if you get like too high up in there 
then you'll drop down below and that's kind of the second problem. If you stay too low, your hand is gonna flip and your elbow is gonna be low here. Yeah. And then that position then forces you to have to throw uphill where your elbow has to climb to the top to get to that position. And then you have to come back down. Yeah, so it's like, huh. um, it's just a, a lot of movement and that leads to like, valgus overload or just medial elbow leading where you're getting into that dart position again interesting yeah so neutral chest elbows at shoulder height you want to feel like you're deep into scapular retraction when you're flipping the hand i think all of those things kind of just lead to that power position we train this position a lot interesting yeah. well i mean it makes sense because like you, if you can't get the launch, it's like the stance almost in for, for catching, right? And I say all the time, a good stance makes everything easier. A bad stance makes everything harder. Mm -hmm. And that's like same thing for this power position. A good power position fixes most everything. And a bad power position leads to all sorts of injuries. 100%. And I think what I like the most about even just your name catching made simple like i love the mindset of doing things simple so the problems are always way more complicated than the solutions yeah, yeah like it's so much more complicated are you fully rocking on like spotify and everything yeah nice you getting good retention or good good you, viewership you know what i think i'm i think so i think so i mean I don't really know. Like it's nothing compared to like the views on short form and stuff, but yeah. I mean, it's it's been good. It's it's just been fun to be able to have a little bit longer, longer format to go more in depth because I've thought about this stuff so much mm -hmm. and I want to turn it into a book. Interesting. And so I'm also a much more verbal processor mm. than like a written processor so so it's fun for me to kind of have the constraint of a podcast episode where i need to focus on one topic and i can very easily make a presentation on it uh -huh. but writing like the chapter is fairly hard so the the podcast has been a fun kind of constraint or vehicle for me to be able to actually like really get those ideas out of my head and into like a real thing if that makes sense yeah that's awesome so then i would love to talk with you a little bit about like pitcher catcher stuff like what do you look for in a catcher like what what's good versus bad look like so no offense to anyone who's caught me in the past that is watching <laughs> this, but I have only had a limited number of good catchers my entire career. And a couple of them were at Biola. So all of our alma mater are in the clear, but <laughs> a lot go. of high school guys, a lot of college guys, a lot of pro guys just really struggle framing the outer half. Huh. And so at least historically for me, I was a big like horizontal guy. So I had a lot of arm side run. You're a two seam slider guy? Mostly just two seam. That's why I'm not in the pros anymore. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I, I formed a cutter or I learned a cutter at the tail end of my career, but it was met with an injury at the same time. So I didn't quite get to capitalize on that but but yeah just being able to command my quote bread and butter pitch was very tough when I was not like 100% confident in my catcher's ability to take that thing from let's say two feet this way because I was a low three-quarter guy and then go across the plate and then run it back 19 to 21 inches of horizontal movement it was it's kind of like a snake movement coming back so a lot of guys didn't even didn't have the ability or the strength to pull that pitch back in for a strike yeah. so that was always the biggest thing for me is if you can't frame it's going to be really tough for me to get on the same page with you and then I'd say the second That's thing. such a great quote. If you can't frame, it's gonna be really tough. Re really what that quote is, is if you can't frame, I don't really want you catching me. Is yeah. really what it is. That's what it is, because I, I was a contact pitcher, but if I needed a put away pitch, it was always gonna be my two seam, like right. freezing them on the outer half. So especially to righties, so like lefties, I could kind of mess up with my changeup pretty good. But righties, I didn't have that, that dominant put 
put away slider. So I really relied heavily on that, that freeze them up on the outer half, one, two, or O2. And so like that, to me, that was always a super valuable person as the person who had the forearm strength and the, and just like the awareness, like spatial awareness to wait for it. A lot of guys would go out there and then pull back at the end and a catcher or an umpire wouldn't call it. So to me, like the guy who was patient and the guy who had good, good ability to frame and stick a pitch, that was, that was always gold for me. Interesting. So, do you know what the bounce is? I watched that video. That Did was you a watch good that one. video? Yeah. So, so in that video, the one with Cruz, is yeah. that the one that you're talking about? So, in the video, what I say is, oh, that's funny. I felt myself mm -hmm. go ball. I was, I was holding back, not interrupting really? you. <laughs> I did it to my, I've done it like probably six times since we've thrown. I got so mad at myself. That's funny. Yeah, <laughs> dude, once, once, cause once you feel that, that arm path and you feel the connection, like it, if you don't do it like that, it just feels inefficient. Yeah. So you do know? you want to know what you did on that one? Yeah. Okay. So you have the good path. You were right here, but then you arrive there too early. And so you actually had to start the movement with your arm before the hip was able to engage. I was actually doing oh. the same thing on the golf course, like everything loads back and then everything's going forward together. But because the hip isn't ahead, like the club head has to take over. It's the same thing with your arm path. If you don't give yourself time to initiate through the lower half, this is gonna reach end range and start and traveling start out. Forward. Yeah, the arm path just naturally wants to stay in motion. It doesn't wanna stop up here and wait for your hips to get sense. going. So if you can kind of be patient with the arm path, even if you are starting from that chest or from up here, wherever you break your hands from, as but long as you're don't patient. Don't go until that hip fires. Right, and don't even think of it like firing. I was listening to an episode that Ben Joyce was in and he talks about like, like smoothly and calmly getting into hip rotation. Like it's, that's not a firing movement. That's, that's the pull back of the rubber band to snap the chest through. So this is the release of the rubber band. This is the stretch of the rubber band. Interesting. Yeah. Dude, I'm learning so much from you right now. <laughs> I got this you, bro. This is cool. No, this, this is, is really a, that was just one of those like a spur of the moment thoughts. That, see, that's why I wanted to film this long form though, because, because this is what always happens with me and Cruz we'll be doing stuff and then all of a sudden we'll be talking about some really awesome stuff that I know that like some people would be really interested in. Yeah. But then we don't film it because we were only filming the short form stuff. So that's why I wanted to pl play catch with you. And film oh this. no, I love it. Anytime I get to play catch, I love it. I got to play catch with my wife more. <laughs> I keep telling her that I'm going to, and then by the time I'm done for the week, I've thrown like probably 17 long toss sessions and my arm's just hanging because I always got to try to be the bigger fish with my, with with your clients? my younger clients. So <laughs> I'm constantly trying to show off and I'm not 25 anymore. So I end up being exhausted and then we don't get out to the field. Fair enough. So what I was saying about the bounce is in that video with Cruz, what I say is the bounce happens when the glove comes up and then down. Right. What it really is, is it's anytime your glove approaches the ball from the center of the plate, mm -hmm. that's when you'll bounce. And so the guys that were like, th and this is partly just how like receiving has changed, mm -hmm. but this is why you see guys starting down and working up. And it's the same thing like on this outside pitch, right? Where if I'm approaching it from the inside, I'm going to have to bounce my glove to bring right. it back. And I'm actually probably gonna take it out of the zone just a bit. And then there's gonna be this big force transfer. Yeah. It's gonna look like a bounce. And it, it most often happens on this pitch, but, but it happens anywhere. So anywhere, anytime that we approach the ball from the center is when we get screwed. And so that's why it's so tough because like when you're in your stance, like if I, if I was to chuck a ball at you right now, see what you just do with your hands? You put it right in front of your face. Yep. And so that's why, well, that's why it's so hard because you have to like retrain your brain and your eyes to like say that it's good for your glove to be down and like kind of to be in a defenseless position. Right. And that's why it's so hard to catch guys with higher velo because when you're not sure where it goes, your hands just 
automatically creep up, which then makes you stab at everything. And then it makes pitchers like you say, I don't want to throw that catcher <laughs> because he can't frame the outside pitch, which I need if I'm going to be able to succeed. Yeah, exactly, man. That makes so much sense. Is that why guys start with their glove on the ground a lot? Yeah, because because you, you literally, the only way to catch this pitch back to the zone is if you start on the outside of it. Mm. And so, like there's this video of JT Real Muto from like three years ago, mm -hmm. and he's in his stance and, and every pitch, right? He's, he's bouncing on every pitch. And now you'll see him and he's down here and he's one motion. He'll slide over, get to it, bring it back. I love it, so he works from low to high? Yeah. Okay. And then, But then, again, same thing, like on this pitch, like on the high pitch, you don't necessarily want to work low to high here. Right. You actually want to get on top of it. And so wherever the ball is, you want to think, get like just a tiny bit outside of it, like compared to the center of the zones. So right. Like if, you, if you have a dot here, wherever the ball is, your glove should be like just a little bit further away from it because that's the only way that we can actually catch it back. That makes sense. Uh, that definitely makes sense. That's why I have respect for catchers because I have no idea how you can frame a, a, a horizontal guy on the outer half and then get a guy who has like that 20 inches of vertical break and still manage to pull that down into the zone. It's trippy, man. <laughs> it is It is very, very trippy. Yeah, that's awesome. Scoot that way a little bit. A little bit. This way a little bit? Right there. There we go. I love it. Okay, so let's wrap up with one more little segment of this. Of the best catchers that you had, let's let's kind of highlight best versus worst. You don't have to mention any names. Okay. But I'm sure with the best, there's common characteristics of what they did. And with the worst, there's common characteristics of what they did. And what we're looking for is really principles of like, what should we try to avoid and what should we try to do? I think it could be summed up with one word, lazy. <laughs> If a catcher's lazy, I don't even want to see him. Huh. Like, I, it's not even just whether they're lazy in a game situation, it's whether they're lazy in bullpens. If they're not blocking stuff in bullpens, I'm not going to trust them in the game, so I'm less likely to throw that curveball in the dirt 0-2. If they're, if they're lazy, I'm less likely to, to trust them when they're putting pitches down, because are they putting that pitch down because they think it's going to get the batter out, or it, because it's going to make them have to work less? Are That's they, a real thing. Yeah, like the, the mindset of a pitcher is it's like, I am 100% confident in the pitch I'm throwing, but if someone else is making me not confident, I'm not gonna throw it because I don't wanna, I don't wanna put my ERA and my career on the line because of someone else's mistake that doesn't even get recognized in the stat line. Like that's, that's all on me. So I want a catcher who I have good chemistry with, who I know is gonna work their butt off. And that starts in the bullpens. And it starts with, how even they they have their stance like the guys who can like do the splits basically are basically the guys i know who are putting their work in off the field and, and getting their mobility work i know they're they're guys who prioritize the little things so they're most likely going to take care of the 99 percent of what they're supposed to be doing and it doesn't even just mean mobility like if they're strong like if they're skinny little athletes like i roasted my little brother like two years ago for being super scrawny and he went off to APU and those guys get after it in the weight room. We kind of went through that in my last podcast episode, but like even being skinny isn't always a good thing. Like looking athletic is one thing, but looking skinny and not looking built just tells me that, that you're not putting in that extra work. So I'm always looking, I'm like not flesh pedaling, but I'm just like sizing guys up yeah. to see if it looks like they, they're going to block that pitch in the ninth inning when I throw a cutter in the dirt or if they're just going to stab at it. Interesting. So, yeah. I think lazy is the right word to okay. kind of talk about a lot of the pitchers or a lot of the catchers that I've had in my career the the least lazy ones are my most favorite interesting so a lot of attention to detail and really what you want to see is really what it is is it's you want to be able to trust them exactly if you trust them game on we're ready to go you're my guy if you don't trust them then it's like I don't know if I want to throw to this guy. <laughs> 100%. And, and so to recap, the things that make you not trust them, I mean, it's a whole range of things. 
dogs, right? They're tight, which means that if they're tight, they probably haven't taken care of their, their mobility, mm -hmm. which means that they're probably slacking on other things. If, they're, if they don't have a good body, then that also tells you this guy might not be as serious in the weight room as he should be. So does that mean that he's not gonna be as serious when it comes to blocking that pitch? Or even just physically able to. Like, or is, is it gonna to... leak right under under the five, six hole, so to speak? Right. <laughs> or is he gonna be able to get a glove down there or get his get his thigh down there? Can, are there, is there daylight? <laughs> or, or can he actually reach the unreachable spots that I can't get to anymore? <laughs> That's so interesting. So trust is really the major thing. Yep. The thing that erodes the trust is any sort of small attention to detail that raises a red flag. Could be their body, could be their mobility, could be their effort in, their bullpen. effort in bullpens, their preparation before the game. All of that, man. My, my best absolute best catchers like i had the privilege of throwing to joe mauer once wow and that dude's attention to detail was off the charts he did he did complain about having to pick up his own baseballs because he was rehabbing in in florida when i was when i was around there but yeah that dude's attention to detail was off the charts he was putting in the extra work he was one of the first guys of the field one of the last guys to leave and he was he was mostly just at first base at that point because he was already like on his way out of his his catching role with the twins, but but he still had that instilled work ethic. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, dude, that's the only way. That's the only way to get to that level is mm -hmm. you have to be so precise on everything that you just have to be obsessed with those little details. Yep. That's good, man. Yeah, cool. All right, should we film? <laughs> no, should we film some short form stuff? Yeah, let's get it, man. Let's do it. Thanks for sharing that. That's of course. That's some some golden wisdom, man. That's if you liked this video, then you would love the Catching Made Simple podcast. Go check out episode one right here. And if you haven't gotten the seven day stance challenge yet, what are you doing? Go get it. CatchingMadeSimple.com/stance.